Well, a happy Resurrection Sunday to you all. It's always a joy and a blessing to bring the Word of God in the church. And thank you for the elders for giving me the opportunity to do so. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. How does that impact your life today? We know that we have a resurrected body coming. And the Lord is going to bless us with a spiritual body and a literal physical body, which is able to do things which we are not even able to comprehend in this life. The resurrection day is a celebration for a Christian. For every Christian, regardless of where they are, this is a day of celebration. But this is also a day of solemn reminder to all of us that we cannot cheat death. Each of us must come to terms that we will die one day. And what happens to us after death is of utmost importance. It is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. But the Bible does teach us that death has been defeated by Jesus Christ's resurrection. Death has been swallowed up by the resurrecting power of Christ. When a person puts their abiding trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and dies, their soul and spirit goes to be with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And their physical body goes to the ground or is cremated. And at a specific time, at the rapture of the church age saints, their soul and their spirit is given a new resurrected body. And in this glorious eternal body, they will dwell in unhindered fellowship with their triune God in the millennial kingdom as well as all throughout eternity. Now, if you have not trusted in Jesus Christ as your only sin bearer, who paid the penalty for your sins on the cross and granted you new life, then when you die, your soul and spirit go straight to hell. And at the proper time, on the day of the great white throne judgment, at the end of the millennium, you will be resurrected too. And your soul and spirit will be joined to a body suited to bear eternal torment. And you will be judged according to your deeds and cast into eternal damnation in the lake of fire. Where you will be tormented, as scripture teaches, day and night, forever and ever. This is the plain, unvarnished truth. And seriously, I'm not making this up. If you read the scriptures you can't make it up. It is so obvious. If we had hope in this world only, we are of all men most miserable, says the Apostle Paul. We must have hope that goes beyond the grave. And that is the title of my message today. I like missionary stories. I like to spend time not reading what people said about them, but reading what they said or what their colleagues said about them. So I've been collecting a story of a missionary, and I hope this would be an encouragement to you. It's a bit grisly, so bear with me. About 123 years ago, almost to this day, around Easter of April 4th, 1901, James Chalmers, a Scottish missionary, and his younger colleague, Reverend Tompkins, had just arrived in the Dopama village on the Fly River district of what is today called Papua New Guinea. When they travel ashore from their boat at the insistence of the natives, immediately they are surrounded by a furious pack of cannibal warriors who attack them with stones and war clubs and repeatedly stab both with cassowary bone daggers, then they viciously hack away at their heads until it is severed from their bodies. 
they cook, charmers torso, clothes and all, with sago root and vegetables, and eat him in this huge tribal feast for which they had invited him. News of this grisly massacre had spread quickly throughout the area, and tribal men paddled in their boats from a long way off, hoping to get a taste, a bite of the white missionary. Months later, it was recounted that they were still chewing on the soles of his shoes. You see, Chalmers had been repeatedly warned about the dangers of entering the Fly River district of Papua New Guinea. He just didn't seem to care all that much about the danger. James Chalmers had come to Papua New Guinea in 1867. That is 34 years ago, and he had spent 34 years of fruitful ministry preaching Christ and establishing churches in the far removed interior regions of Papua New Guinea. And even he lost his first wife and married again and lost his second wife before this day. James Chalmers had hope beyond the grave which affected how he lived, and his passion to win lost souls was grounded in the physical resurrection of the dead and a deep love for his Savior. He went to Dopama village that Easter day because his hope was firmly fixed on the resurrection of Christ. And he did not fear death because he knew he too will be resurrected if he was killed. His missionary friends called him a fool. And one of them wrote, and I quote, Chalmers is crazy, but his fearlessness disarms the fiercest warriors as he boldly goes among them unarmed. His fearlessness has brought him through dozens of deaths, I'm sure during his long service for Christ in New Guinea. Chalmers was fearless for the gospel to his very end. Does the fear of death or even an embarrassment stop you from knowing Christ or even sharing the gospel with others? You see, James Chalmers never feared death. He gave his life at the highest price for the redemption of the cannibals of Papua New Guinea. Long, courageously, and faithfully, he spent his life by God's grace and sustaining power in leading poor, wretched, miserable, degraded, sinful savages into the light and liberty of Jesus Christ. And for this, he received the terrible, through, though glorious, blood-stained crown of martyrdom as a reward for his labors. Only a week before he died, he wrote in his own journals, which we have today, and I quote, time shortens and I have much to do. How grand it would be to sit down in the midst of work and just hear the master say, your part is finished, come. Little did Chalmers know that a week later his master would say, come and he came. This Resurrection Sunday morning, we will be looking at a familiar chapter in the Apostle Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. And we will be in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, and we will look at verses 12 to 19 and learn that our true hope is beyond the grave and how this hope is firmly based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ and this hope should drive us to serve God boldly with passion, as James Chalmers did, even to the day he was martyred. So follow along with me in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I will be reading from the New American Standard Version, verses 1 to verse 20, for the larger context. 1 
Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God was the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Verse 12. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if... Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. Moreover, we have, been, we have even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we had hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of all those who are asleep. Join me in a moment of prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, open your word to our hearts today. Grant us undivided attention to understand and to apply the centrality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in our daily life by the power of the Holy Spirit, and use this message to your inadequate servant to bring glory to yourself and move each of us one step closer towards Christ's likeness. We ask this for our Lord's sake. Amen. Now the Apostle Paul, if you know this letter, and a familiar letter, wrote to the Corinthian church from the city of Ephesus while on his third missionary journey. This was his second letter to them, but we call it the first letter because this was the first letter in our scriptures. The thrust of Paul's letter in this entire first Corinthians is to correct wrong belief in the Corinthian church which had led them to wrong living. The church at Corinth was exceptionally factional showing its carnality and immaturity, Paul had to address several issues in the Corinthian church in this letter. False teaching had devastated and dulled the Corinthian believers' lives so much that many Corinthians believed the fact about the resurrection, but were blind and failed to see how they could be resurrected too. This had robbed them of the zeal to serve the Lord their savior, and they turn to carnality. Now, if you look at this entire book up to chapter 15, Paul deals with a lot of issues from a letter which he receives from Chloe's people. 
Divisiveness was rampant in the church. He deals with that in chapter one. Unbiblical discernment was being practiced among the church members. Paul deals with it in chapters two to four. Sexual immorality was being tolerated in the church. Paul responds to that in chapter five. Unrighteous judgments were common among believers. Believers were suing one another in the church, and Paul responds to that in chapter six. Marital difficulties were left unresolved, and Paul deals with the whole issue of singleness and marriage in chapter seven. Lifestyle disagreements were not being handled, so Paul responds to that in chapter nine. Male and female distinctions were not being honored among the church. Paul responds in chapter 11. Ministry differences were not being accepted based on their spiritual gifts which God had given them. So Paul deals with them in chapter 12 and then later on in chapters 13 and 14 because they were giving improper emphases to the gifts rather than how the gifts ought to be ministered in love. And finally in chapter 15, our chapter today, the essential doctrines like the gospel, the resurrection, were not clearly understood. Maybe if they had the New Testament at this point in time, they could have read John eleven twenty five and sorted out this issue when Jesus said the comforting words, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. But they didn't have John's gospel with them. You see, the Corinthians believed in the resurrection. That wasn't the issue but they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They believed in the resurrection of Jesus, but not in the resurrection of the dead. This had caused some kind of a laziness to creep into the church, and their zeal for the Lord was gone. Instability in every area of their lives was causing havoc in the church. One of the commentaries I was reading said it is possible buried deep in their thinking because many of them were Gentiles and they came from the Greek culture, they might have believed that the body was a prison in which the soul was uh, kept as a prisoner, incarcerated, and that in death the soul that is good is free. To a person with this kind of background, the idea of a bodily resurrection would be offensive. The dualistic thinking. They may have been a reaction to a popular Jewish idea that the day the resurrection meant that the present physical life would start all over again. You're back in the same body, in the same world. Maybe they had that wrong understanding. We're not sure for certain. You might think, well, we're not like the Corinthian church. At SDG, we're a lot more mature. You know, every... Resurrection Sunday, we listen to a message on the resurrection. And we probably go back home celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. But have you thought that one day you will be resurrected and how that knowledge should motivate your present living? How can that drive you to serve the, the Lord boldly now? We tend to be escapists. You know, we live for the here and now. This is life. Let us live our life with all the gusto and then maybe get even some more. Let's enjoy a good message, but let it not have any impact on our lives. I hope that's not the case with you as you listen to this message. <clears throat> Excuse me. I like what John Calvin said in this chapter, and I quote him. Christ did not die or rise again for himself, but for us. Hence, his resurrection is the foundation of ours. And what was accomplished in him must be fulfilled in us also. So today, I want to propose to you eight reasons why we must have true hope beyond the grave and how these reasons will motivate us to serve our master with passion. Eight reasons why we have true hope beyond the grave. Conversely, 
You could also see eight ridiculous conclusions if Christ did not resurrect from the dead. So I'll mention both of them. And you can see the argument Paul makes. Firstly, we have hope that is beyond the grave from verse 12 because Christ was raised from the dead. So we have hope that is beyond the grave because Christ was raised from the dead. Look at verse 12. Now if Christ is preached, Paul says, that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? And here's the first ridiculous conclusion you can come to. If there is no resurrection, Christ was not raised and it's still dead. That seems superfluous. All other conclusions flow from this. And Paul paints a very dark picture of what it would be to live in a world without resurrection. All the preaching would be empty. Our witnessing would be false. There would be no forgiveness of sins. We would all face death without any hope. And we would be tortured by the thought of those whom we love, who believed in Christ, who died. They have perished forever. Verse 12 forms the basis of Paul's argument. Paul has already supported the historical fact about the bodily resurrection of Christ in verses 1 to 11. And we know that the Corinthian church believed in the resurrection. Paul bases his argument that because the Corinthians believed in the gospel, look at verse 11, so we preached and you believed. Their faith was linked with the resurrection of Christ. They knew that because Christ was raised from the dead, resurrection was possible. I mean, how can anyone deny the resurrection of Christ if there's undeniable proof? So taking their faith in the Lord's resurrection as a starting point, Paul will now prove that this logically involves faith in the bodily resurrection of all others who are in him. So Paul's logic, if you want to look at verses 12 to 19, goes somewhat like this. If he and the other apostles preach that Christ is resurrected, resurrection is a reality for humans. Because a human, Christ, fully God, fully man, was resurrected. Hence, if we deny the resurrection of the dead, then we imply that Christ has not been raised from the dead. And therefore, our preaching is in vain. That means we are false witnesses as we misrepresent God, and thus our faith is useless, and we remain in our sin. Do you see that logic? So, again, quoting from John Calvin, from Christ to us in this way, if Christ is risen, then we will rise. If Christ is not risen, then we will not rise. And now from us to Christ, on the other hand, Calvin says, if we rise, then Christ is risen. If we do not rise, then neither is Christ risen. If you and I deny the future physical and bodily resurrection of yourself as a Christian, that means Christ is still dead. That means Paul wasted his time writing this letter. That means all our family who believed in the Lord, they're still in their sins and they're still in the grave. If there is no resurrection, there is no gospel. I have to caution you when you bring the gospel to others, mention the resurrection. That is the central pillar of the gospel. You may ask, what is the resurrection? Well, here's a short Summary of it. Resurrection is the transformation of a corpse into a living, supernatural body, and as such is to be sharply distinguished from resuscitation of a dead individual into the ordinary pre mortem state of life. So, resurrection is not resuscitation, which is the mere restoration of life to a corpse is not resurrection. A person who has been resuscitated returns only to this earthly life and will die again. 
Our Lord Jesus rose to eternal life in a radically transformed body that can be described as immortal, glorious, powerful, supernatural. And Jesus, in this new mode of existence, was not bound by the physical limitations of this universe, but possessed superhuman powers. The resurrection body is immortal, being impossible to die, impossible to age, insusceptible to any illness, to disease, impossible to injure, able to vanish and reappear at will. Back to our text. Now, Paul has already shared the gospel with the Corinthians in verses 1 to 11. So his logic here is impeccable. If Christ was raised from the dead, it follows that there must be such a thing called resurrection of the dead. And if one assumes that there is no resurrection from the dead, there is no Messiah who resurrected from the dead. Now, we know that God the Father raised Christ from the dead. When Paul preached some years ago on his first missionary journey in the Pisidian Antioch, in Acts 13, verse 34, he says, And he, God, raised him, Jesus, from the dead, no more to return to decay. Peter, on his second sermon at Solomon's portico in the temple, in Acts 3, verses 14 to 15, says, But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead. Peter's testimony was the same. And he also adds a fact to which we are witnesses. So we know that God the Father raised Christ from the dead. We also know from scriptures that Christ raised himself from the dead. I'll just mention a few verses here. John chapter 2, verse 19 to 22. Jesus answered here, these are those against whom who were responding to him. He says, destroy this temple in three days. I will raise it up. And obviously the Jews couldn't figure out what he was referring to because they were thinking the temple took 46 years to build. And then in verse 21, John 2, verse 21, Jesus says he was speaking of the temple of his body. And then in verse 22, so when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. In John 10, verse 18, Jesus says, no one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. Jesus himself said, he is able to resurrect himself. We also know that the Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead. So the whole resurrection was the work of the triune Godhead. In Romans 8, verse 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, did you see that? The spirit of whom, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. And there are many other scriptures I can go to. Well, the Old Testament prophets, they prophesied that Jesus would be raised from the dead. You didn't have to look at the New Testament, you have to go back to the Old. In Psalm 16, verse 10, David says, You will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. And just in this chapter, we know that Paul jointly testified that Jesus was raised and he was seen by eyewitnesses. He appeared to Peter or Cephas in verse 5. Obviously, he appeared to Mary Magdalene much earlier on in John 20. Then Jesus appeared to the 12 apostles in verse 5. He appeared to 500 believers, appeared to James and to all the apostles. And then he appeared to Paul himself. You know, Muhammad died on June 8, 632 AD at the age of 61. Today, thousands of Muslims visit his tomb to mourn his death, never to celebrate his resurrection. The tomb of Lenin, Nikolai Lenin, the founder of communism and the leader of the Bolshevik revolution, 
is in the Red Square in Moscow today and is visited daily by thousands of people mourning his death, not celebrating his resurrection. Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated in the Birla House on Jan 30th, 1948, at the age of 78. Many visit his tomb, but never to celebrate his resurrection. You see, brothers and sisters, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection is central to our faith. And is there in no other religion? Christ has risen from the dead. The Corinthians believed it, and so do you. And that gives you the reason to have hope beyond the grave. Let's move on. Secondly, we have a hope that is beyond the grave from verse 13. Because as Christ was resurrected, the dead in Christ will be resurrected. Because as Christ is resurrected, we just learned that from the first point, the dead in Christ will be resurrected. Look at verse 13. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. So here's the absurd, ridiculous conclusion one can come from if you believe how Paul is writing his argument. If there is no resurrection of Christ, the dead are really dead. And they will never be resurrected. If this fact is true, that is, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ was not raised from the dead. But this cannot be true. Verses 5 to 10, we just looked at it. Paul mentions several hundred eyewitnesses that look at his appearance and witness the resurrected Christ. Christ himself, when he was on the earth, in John 6, said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up. Christ has the ability to raise us up. In John eleven twenty five, when Christ visits Lazarus' death, and he says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live. Well, Lazarus was dead. But Jesus says, he who believes in me shall live. He's talking about life beyond the earthly state. Here, what Paul is saying, in the words of the commentator Lenski, a universal negative, that no resurrection from the dead, cannot be established if one fact, Christ rose from the dead, to the contrary exists. So a universal negative cannot be established if one fact to the contrary exists. If Christ rose, the resurrection was established. For then it had already begun. Actually, if you read on to Paul's argumentation, Paul does talk about the order of the resurrection and the results in the marriage for Christians in verses 20 to 28 in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then he further goes on and talks about the moral implications of Christ's resurrection and how the bodies of the resurrected will be. I mean, is he lying? He's not. He's telling them the truth. Did you know that the scriptures teach that one day our soul will be reunited with our spirit and our body in a brand new resurrected body? I know some of us are getting older here. I see a lot of youngsters, but there are many of us who are getting older. And you know, when you go down to tie your shoelaces, you might as well pick some trash before you straighten your back up. You know, things don't work as well as they did when you were in your 20s. I don't know about you, I'm looking forward to that resurrected body someday. Scriptures mention four stages of the resurrection, according to my understanding. First is Christ. He is the first fruits, and he was resurrected first. That happened in 33 AD. And you can see that in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23. Christ is our first fruits. After that, those who are Christ's at his coming. The second recognized stage of the resurrection, if our Lord does not return before we die here today, 
then we, the church age believers, will be resurrected with the church age saints at the rapture, and we will receive our resurrected bodies in the air. The third stage of resurrection are the Old Testament believers and tribulation saints. They will join us in their resurrected bodies at the second coming of Christ to the earth, at the beginning of the millennial reign in Revelation 20, verse 4. And then the non-glorified saints, the saints with normal human bodies, who walk in the millennium at the end of the seven-year tribulation must receive glorified bodies at some point in time. These non-glorified saints will likely receive resurrection bodies immediately at death, or maybe at the end of the millennium, as 1 Corinthians 15, 50 states. The fourth is the resurrection of the redeemed, unredeemed of all the time, all the unbelieving dead. And this will happen at the end of the millennium, just before the great white throne of judgment. So there are four recognized stages of resurrection. And I hope that gives you hope. That gives you hope that you can serve the Lord wholeheartedly without being concerned about your safety in this physical life. You know, research had shown that food, clothing, shelter are the three most important things we look for in life. And the fourth being love. God said the first three have been given already to you. You don't have to ask them if you're a believer. The Lord provides for your needs. And who would want a love lower than the love of Christ? You have the love of Christ already. You have the inspired word of God and you have the best teacher within you. You should have no fear at all. None whatsoever. The church needs to be a vibrant representation of Christ in this world. And sometimes I fear we listen to a message and we go back and say, well, let's celebrate resurrection. Let's have a meal, praise the Lord, and go back to our old lifestyles. Do the same things we did before Sunday came. Let me move on. We have hope that is beyond the grave. Thirdly, because gospel proclamation was not devoid of the truth of the resurrection. We see this truth in the first half of verse 14. Gospel proclamation was not devoid of, devoid of the truth of the resurrection. Look at verse 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And here's the ridiculous conclusion you can come up to. If there is no resurrection of Christ, then don't waste your time preaching. It's a lie. And now in verses 14 to 19, you can look at it in your Bible. This is so easy to notice. Just in the text, in the English text, you can see that. Look at verse 13 and verse 16. They're very similar, right? And verse 14 and verse 17 are very similar. So verses 14 to 15, there's one loop of logic and then the logic extends in verses 17, 18, and 19. So you have these two uh, loops of logic. And here's kind of, let me try to put that together for you. So in verses 14 to 19, Paul lays out all the problems that would be created if Jesus Christ did not rise up from the dead. First, he says that our preaching will be absolutely useless and empty of content. That's the first half of verse 14. And then he says our faith, which we say we have in him, is ineffective, is useless. That is the end of verse 14. And then thirdly, he says the proclamation, which we have that we proclaim the gospel as if we are witnesses of Christ, is a false witness. That is verses 15 and 16. And then fourthly, he says the pardon which we said we have for our sins, the forgiveness, that's not possible through Christ because he didn't rise. That's verse 17. And then in verse 18, he talks about those who have died believing in Christ. He says, well, then they perished. They were destroyed. And then finally, he comes to a conclusion in verse 19. If you have a promise of a hope beyond the grave, 
that's not true. And you're living a miserable life. That's the conclusion he comes to at the end of it. That's the reason why I put this title of this sermon, that we have a hope that goes beyond the grave. It doesn't stop at the grave. Actually, it begins much before. It begins at salvation. And it goes through the process of sanctification. And finally, when we are glorified in our resurrected bodies with the Lord. Years ago, when I was uh, buying my first car, it was a, a white, a pearl white Toyota Camry, four-door sedan. I had never owned a car before, and I, about 30 years ago, when I first bought this car, I was so happy, I was feeling like a millionaire. Um, like I had the best car, I could go where I want. You know, this is in the US. So I, I, I drove the car after making the payments, I drove it off the lot, the new car lot, and after it turned around the bend, it stopped. And I just had this vision that what a waste of my money. A new car would just stopped, and I was uh, furious, obviously, so I tried to see, you know, if everything is fine, and looked around, looked at the gauges, and I couldn't figure it out. I was new, I'd never seen a car gauge before. I didn't know what to look for. I finally got so embarrassed after half an hour, I called uh, uh, support, you know, someone to come and help me. And when the technician came, uh, he looked at my gauge and he began to laugh. So to my increasing embarrassment, I asked him, why are you laughing? He said, sir, there is no fuel. <laughs> That's why your car is not moving. So no matter how much I pressed the accelerator, the car wouldn't move because it had no fuel. Paul is saying the same thing here. If Christ is not raised from the dead, it's like my empty gas tank, then our proclamation, which is like hitting the gas pedal, is empty, it's vain, it's devoid of truth. It does not have any powerful, lasting effects. We are wasting our time, our message has no power, and it will not take us anywhere. But that was not Paul's testimony. Paul said, my own testimony did not reflect that. Back in the earlier part of this letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, Paul writes, he says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Paul said, I preached the gospel because I had complete assurance in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that I would be resurrected. He says, Christ sent me to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. And further on in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 to 5, Paul continues his argument and says, my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom. He didn't rely on his own strength, but he kept preaching. So Paul is telling the Corinthians that we, he and the apostles, preached the gospel faithfully, did we not? Then why do you believe not in the resurrection of yourselves? That's the third point. Fourthly, we have a hope that is beyond the grave because the object of our trust validates our faith. That's the end of verse 14. Look at verse 14, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. Your faith also is vain. I mean, if we say we believe in Jesus Christ is the object of our faith, and if resurrection is not true for us, then our object of our faith is invalidated. So that's the ridiculous conclusion. If there is no resurrection of Christ, then my faith and your faith is devoid of any intellectual, moral, or spiritual value. It is zero. Go back to verses 3 and 4. Paul says Christ died for our sins and was buried and he was raised on the third day so if we deny the first proposition, that Christ died for our sins, then the other proposition, Christ was raised on the third day, is by default denied. And so Paul adds a second consequence here. He says, your faith is in vain. That means your confidence you put on Christ 
is useless. Dear friends, Jesus Christ is the object of our trust as Christians. But if Christ did not rise from the dead, our faith is in a good Savior who lived a perfect life and died but did not resurrect. That is, he had no power over death. If you go to the end of chapter 15, we have victory, not because of the cross, yes we do, but because of the resurrection. Because, verse 54, but when this perishable will put on the imperishable, when you will receive a resurrected body, and this mortal will have put on immortality then. Did you see that? When and then? Then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. If Christ is not raised from the dead, then we have no object to put our faith in. Who do we put our faith in? Our faith is in the singular person of Jesus Christ. And if he did not raise from the dead, we have no guarantee that we will raise from the dead. None at all. If we have no object of our faith in all our preaching, my standing here would be a lie. And you would be believing a lie and your faith would be empty, hollow, without reality, no effect, a mirage, useless, baseless, and would have no foundation for your confidence. But that is not the case. Your faith is in the person of Jesus Christ. Is it not? It is. Paul himself said in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 and 2, the gospel which I preached, you received, Corinthians, by which you are saved. And then in verse 11, we preached and you believed. Paul is saying, didn't I spend one and a half years with you teaching you the word of God when I came to you? In Acts 17, verse 11, we know that Paul settled for a year and a half teaching the word of God among them. You know, I don't want a dead savior to put my faith in, would you? I want one who is resurrected, one who is living, a dead savior cannot take my sins away and rescue me from God's wrath or develop a relationship with me. Christ lives, so our faith is not empty. It's about the time when you said hallelujah. Fifthly, we have hope that is beyond the grave in verse 15 because we are not false witnesses concerning God because we're not false witnesses concerning God. Look at verse 15. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. Here's the ridiculousness of the fifth conclusion here. If there is no resurrection of Christ, then your faith and my faith is pseudo-faith, false faith. The Bible and God are a bunch of liars. And that's the point which is made by the Apostle Paul. The argument flow about being a false witness for God leads us to either Paul is lying or the bigger insinuation that God is lying in this book. I mean, are Peter and the Apostles liars? They just mentioned Peter saw the Lord's resurrected body. Are the 500 men whom Paul mentioned who saw the resurrected body, are they liars? What about the Old Testament prophets? When they mentioned about the resurrection, are they liars? What about Job? In Job 19, verse 26, Job mentions resurrection. Is Job a liar? What about Daniel? In Daniel 12, verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. It's talking about the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. Is he lying? I mean, is all this a sham? Are we wasting our time? Is God a liar? Maybe we should just close this book and just go to the crocodile park and enjoy a nice walk and have hollow hollow. <laughs> 
just relax. This is all a lie. To the churches in Galatia who struggled, Paul was insistent to them when he was giving them the gospel that he was not lying. I'm going to read Galatians 1, verses 11 to 20. You can follow along in your Bibles. Just listen. Here's Paul's argument. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. Galatians chapter 1, verse 12. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. But I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and try to destroy it. I was, and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days, but I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And then in your Bibles is in parentheses. Now, in what I'm writing to you, I assure you before God, I am not lying. Paul's testimony was not a lie. Coming back to 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 16. Paul will repeat the basis of his argument as he did in verses 13 and 14. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ was raised. And now in verse 17, we see the sixth reason why we have hope beyond the grave. The sixth reason in verse 17, because the message of our faith is one of forgiveness from our sins. Look at verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. And here's the ridiculous conclusion which you can come to. If there is no resurrection of Christ, then you and I are still sinners. And there is no hope of forgiveness for us or for anyone in Christ. If Christ is not raised from the dead, we have no forgiveness of sins. What did John the Baptist say when he saw Jesus coming in John chapter 1? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Here, it's a very strong argument made in the book uh, by the author of the book of Hebrews. In the first 13 verses, he reminds us that we need a substitute. And that substitute was there from the Old Testament sacrifice times. In Hebrews chapter 10, for the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year after year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers would have been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins? I mean, if, the, if you went to the law, and I mean, you would take animals, you know, just imagine coming to church with your goat or with a dove or turtle dove, and you have to provide sacrifices every time you enter church. In the Old Testament, that's what they did when they went to the temple or the tabernacle. They offered sacrifices for covering of their sin. Verse 3, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes, Jesus comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. A whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, quoting from Psalm 40, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. 
after saying above sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law, then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, and then the writer writes, once for all. Verse 11, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away our sins. But he, Christ, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. How did he do that? Through his resurrection. His resurrection proved his sacrifice to God was pleasing and his work was done. And now we have full access to God the Father if we have put our faith and trust in him. So by the resurrection, Jesus sits on the right hand of God. Right hand of God is a place of power. And his sitting indicates that the work has been finished. You know, before the Lord saved me, I was a Hindu. And I cannot imagine and tell you story after story what I did every, every festival. I would go to the temple and offer sacrifices for my sins. My mother would go with me. No amount of sacrifices I gave would even cover my sins lest even pay for them. If there's no forgiveness of our sins, our faith is worthless, our empty, hollow, useless, idle. It gets us nothing. And we're still in our sins, and we will die in them. That's what Jesus says in John 8, 21 to the Pharisees. You will die in your sins. But we can attest that we have received forgiveness of sin. Have we not? That is the proof of the resurrection. Paul is saying, I preached forgiveness of sins to you. Christ died for our sins. Without the resurrection, there could be no certainty of atonement. And the Corinthians would remain in a state of alienation from God and in their sin. Without the resurrection, there is also no redemption. No reconciliation between the Corinthians and in God, no justification, no life, no salvation. Seventhly, we have hope that is beyond the grave, and this is from verse 18, because past believers have not perished in their sins. Look at verse 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 18. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And here's the ridiculous conclusion that you come to in Paul's argumentation. If you believe there is no resurrection of Christ, then all believers in Christ who are dead are eternally in their sins and have perished with no hope. A false premise results in a false conclusion. A false premise that there's no resurrection of Christ results in a false conclusion that if you have fallen asleep, you're perished. John MacArthur writes in this verse, every saint, Old Testament, or Christian who had died would have to be forever perished. The same consequence, consequence would apply to every saint who has died since Paul wrote this letter. Paul himself, the other apostles, Augustine, Calvin, Luther, Wesley, Moody, and every other believer of every other age would spend eternity in torment without God and hope. Their faith would have been in vain. Their sins would have been unforgiven and their destiny would be damnation. That's the impact of there's no resurrection. So in a crushing way, Paul brings to home to his readers, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he brings home this truth, which I think was, is wonderfully put by the commentator Lenski, and I quote him here, he who persists in this denial, that's the denial of the resurrection, writes over every believer's tomb, lost or damned. 
And finally, we have a hope that is beyond the grave in verse 19. And that's the conclusion. Because we are not miserable Christians in this life. Sometimes I look at myself in a mirror and I, I think, well, I'm pretty miserable today. You know, when we believe in the resurrection and we know our faith is based on the resurrection of Christ, we don't live miserable lives regardless of what estate we have. Paul concludes his argument in verse 19, if we have hope in Christ in this life only. He doesn't say don't put your hope in Christ in this life. He says if this is the only hope you have in this life, we are of all men most to be pitied. And here's the ridiculous conclusion you come up to. If there is no resurrection of Christ, then you, dear Christian, are of all people most miserable, most to be pitied in this life because you have no future hope. You know, we don't know the day of our birth. We are told in our birth certificates, we don't even know the day of our death. What hope do we have if we don't know when we're going to die? If Christ is not raised from the dead, we have no hope beyond the grave. Was Paul miserable in his life? He was ready to preach and die for the resurrection of the dead. He preached the message without neglecting the resurrection of the dead. To the Sanhedrin in Acts 23 verse 6, Paul's testimony says, I am on trials for the hope and the resurrection of the dead. For that reason, he was put for two years in Caesarea in jail. And then he was brought before the Sanhedrin. Before Felix in Acts 24 verse 15, Paul says, there shall certainly be a resurrection. Before Agrippa in Acts 26 verse 23, by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. You think Paul ignored the message of the resurrection. That was the drumbeat of his ministry. He brought it out time and again. The entirety of Christianity hangs on the truth of the resurrection. Without the resurrection, the salvation and the blessings it brings Christianity would be pointless and pitiable. Without the resurrection, we would have no savior, no forgiveness, no gospel, no meaningful faith, no life, no hope for any of those things. Without the resurrection, the gospel is an empty bag of air. It's like a soap bubble. There's nothing in it. Christ is not alive now if he has not been raised, and this means that right now people are still in their sins. And there's no atoning sacrifice on their behalf. Without the resurrection, our Christian life is a dead-end street. We might as well get off it and live the way we want to. I like what Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote as a commentary on verse 12. He summarizes it and says, In summary, the resurrection of Christ and of believers is essentially to the Christian faith and hope. Without it, there is no church, no preaching, no proof Christ is God's son, no conquest of death, no forgiveness, no salvation, no future kingdom. We must hold fast to the literal, physical resurrection. End of quote. You see, dear friends, the two resurrections, Christ's and ours, stand together or fall together. They could not be one without the other. Furthermore, if there is no resurrection, the gospel is meaningless and worthless. The promise of hope beyond the grave is a false promise. And that leaves me and you as believers living a miserable life on this earth, waiting to be released from all the struggles and trials of life by death. If you look at Paul's argument in this whole chapter, he talks about the order of the resurrection, the implication of the resurrection, the bodies of the resurrected dead, and see how he ends chapter 15. He says, thanks be to God 
who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he doesn't end there. He ends with a strong admonition in verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, and that's my admonition to you all, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. That gives purpose to everything we do as a Christian. Everything. That's the reason Paul says, Corinthians, be steadfast, be immovable, abound in the work of the Lord. Keep doing it in the point of exhaustion. You know, the Scottish missionary, I just spoke to you when we started this message, James Chalmers, and his toils among the cannibals of Papua New Guinea was not in vain. Because a decade earlier than James Chalmers, Fijian native missionaries beat James Chalmers to Papua New Guinea. They came before him. What a flock of fools for Christ they were, these guys. You see, the gospel made its way to Fiji for the first time in 1840s. A large number of Polynesians were radically converted to Christ, and they quickly began to have a burden on their heart for missions. They decided that they wanted to take the gospel to Papua New Guinea, 2,500 miles, right? Papua New Guinea, and down here, Fiji, 2,500 miles. They knew they were cannibals in Papua New Guinea, and they too were cannibals a few years before. So do you know what happened? These newly converted Fijians understood the danger. They knew the gruesome story of the wild, cannibalizing, head-hunting natives of Papua New Guinea. They knew that many of their numbers would be killed. Did you know what these Fijians did? When I read this story, I was crying. They built their own coffins Pack their belongings in these coffins, put these coffins in deep sea canoes, and sailed for 2,500 miles northwest in the South Pacific and landed on the south coast of Papua New Guinea in 1871. Their mindset was, we died before we left. That's why they packed their coffin. The first wave of Fijian missionaries was completely wiped out from malarial fever and the cannibals. However, they kept coming wave after wave until eventually the gospel was established in New Guinea. This is even before James Chalmers ministered in the Fly River District. These Polynesian missionaries had hope beyond the grave, didn't they? They knew if they were to be cannibalized, they would be resurrected. Just as Christ was raised from the dead, they too would receive a brand new resurrected body. They too would receive that body at the rapture when they meet the Lord in the air. This was their true hope beyond the grave, and they gave their lives for the gospel. You know, God may not call you or me to be a James Chalmers or to even be one of the Fijian missionaries like them, but we are called to preach the gospel. We're called to correct false teaching so that those to whom we minister, including ourselves, have a true hope beyond the grave based on the resurrection from the dead because Christ rose from the dead. Then our service to the Lord would be steadfast, would be immovable, would be always abounding and never in vain. May this truth sink into our hearts this resurrection day and may it fire our zeal as we serve Christ in whatever capacity our master chooses. He is alive and we have a hope beyond the grave. Maybe you're sitting right here in the church. You've been going to church for months, maybe even years, or maybe you're visiting here as a visitor for the first time, or maybe you just come here on Easter and Christmas. Well, your presence here is no accident in God's sovereign plan. You too, with us, can have hope, true hope in Christ. You too can be a part of the first resurrection. But your sin, 
it's paying you a huge salary, and that salary is death. Your indwelling sin and your sinful life is paying you a penalty of death. So when God, who is the creator and the owner of everything, requires that you and I live in perfect obedience to his law, we can because Christ did, because Christ did it for us, the perfection was achieved in Christ, but you don't have him. And you cannot live in perfect obedience to God's law. God says you're not only a sinner from conception, but when you came out of your mother's womb, you continually break God's law. Just the other day I was reading about hell, about the legitimacy of why God would have hell and have a place of eternal torment forever and ever for those who have steadfastly refused him, hardened their hearts, even after the thousand year millennium when Satan is released from the abyss, there'll be many who come against Christ in Revelation 20. And the Lord's gonna destroy them. I don't want you to be destroyed if you don't know Christ. I don't want you to be in the lake of fire at the end of the great white throne judgment spoken about in Revelation 20. Believe. Believe in Christ. Believe that he came to earth. Believe that he's truly God and truly man. Believe he was sinless. Believe that he lived in a sinful world and demonstrated God's love by dying on the cross to pay sin's penalty. And then he rose from the grave and he's alive today. This is the resurrection. The resurrection is the validation of God receiving him. And this is what we celebrate today. But don't come to Christ in your terms. In your terms, you can put on the clothes of Christianity. You can act like you are a Christian. You can even bring a Bible, a MacArthur study Bible to church. But if your heart has not fully trusted in Christ, and you're trying to please him by the good works of coming to church, going to a group, being with Christians, Christianity doesn't come by osmosis. It comes by humbling yourself. It comes by putting yourself fully on your knees before the Lord. Do you genuinely believe and put your faith and trust in Christ? Have you repented from your sin of unbelief? And have you received the gift of God through faith in what Christ did 2,000 years ago? Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, and this is a warning if you've never believed in Christ, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, he will enter. And the will of the Father is to repent, to believe in his Son, to cling to him, to trust in him. There is no resurrection hope for you if you have not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. To Martha, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? You know what Martha said? Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. So I ask you, if you're sitting here and you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, will you turn from all that dishonors God and will you believe in Christ as your only Lord and Savior so that you too might have true hope beyond the grave? Repent. One singular word, turn in your mind from what you were to who Christ is and believe and you will be saved. You know, if you have any questions about your faith and you're really struggling, come and talk to me. Come and talk to our elders. I think our elders are here. Talk to them. Don't leave this place without knowing if you're genuinely saved. If you have any questions, I would welcome you. I would welcome, love to talk to you. Our elders are here. They would love to talk to you. Don't leave this place without trusting in Christ. He is your hope. And his Hope given 
is beyond the grave. You don't know what's going to happen when you leave this place. You don't know if you're going to get hit by something. You would die, have a heart attack. You don't control it. There's one thing you can do. You can repent and you can believe in Christ. Let's pray. Dear gracious and loving Heavenly Father, today the resurrection of Christ is a day to remember the hope we have because of our Savior. If we had hope only in this life, Lord, your word says we are of most men pitiable. Our hope transcends the grave. And we believe that our Lord Jesus was raised from the dead and is alive and we too will be raised in the future at the rapture. Christ is our first fruits of your resurrecting work. And that will be completed in us when your son comes for his church. Grant us a joy, Lord, and a boldness to serve your son that transcends our situation, our circumstances. And for those who are among us, who do not know you, may this be the day when your sovereign work in their hearts might give fruit to the gift of repentance and faith so that they might believe in Christ. All this, Lord, we ask in Christ's name and for your glory. Amen. Please stand as I pray for our offering and then remain standing for the benediction. Heavenly Father, you are the owner of everything in this universe. How can we give you anything? You own everything. Out of what you have given each of us, may you cause in our hearts to give liberally, to give generously, so that we at SDG may continue the work of making disciples of Christ, trusting in your power, working in us through the ministry of your eternal word. Please grant us this joy to give of ourselves to you first before we give of our finances to the church. All this we ask for our master's sake. Amen. And now for the benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever.